First of all, I'd like to say welcome to this event. This is, I'm honored and privileged to be here. Most of you know that the wall moves around on the interstates in this country, escorted often by highway patrol, state troopers, and law enforcement, and by the Patriot Riders who consider it a special mission and part of their life to escort this wall, and I appreciate what they do. I want to thank them for that. Uh, in 1968, I didn't know a lot about the war, but I had been put back into my old reserve unit, the 173rd out of Greenwood, Mississippi. President Johnson activated our unit, the only reserve unit activated during Vietnam, and many, many National Guard units. And we did a little advanced training, and I arrived in Da Nang in September, early part of September of 1968, locked and loaded, 40 rounds of ammo, full combat gear, as the plane taxi, they said, get off running and hit the trail and follow to the bridge. That's what we did. My first night in country, I was sergeant of the guard on China Beach. If you're talking about scared, man, I was petrified. I had left a three-week-old baby and a wife at home, knowing I may never see them again, knowing I may never see anybody else in my family again, like some of the guys on this wall. It's pretty tough. But we ended up outside of the old Imperial Capital Way at a place called John Lee's Combat Base, next to the 101st Airborne. Several of the members of the 101st are here today. We were soon shown our new home, living in GP medium tents on top of a hill. Brand new tents, perfect targets for Charlie and the BC and the NBAs, which uh, they took advantage of. They marched mortars right down through the middle of our trail. We did dig some trenches. But the 101st, bless their heart, I love them, they would ran Charlie out somewhere, they were out of mortar range. That lasted for about two months until we started getting 122 millimeter rockets. And uh, that tore up our little chapel, what few of us went to church, the best hall and all the tents in the camp. One of the units close to us was the 138th Artillery Unit out of Kentucky. They'd been activated just as we were. And we got to know the guys because we were a petroleum outfit that delivered fuel to most of the Allied forces. I was a dispatch supervisor, so I got to know a lot of the guys by phone or by radio using the SOPs. And by the way, we had four Navajos in our unit who could do code talking. They just never could get a Navajo word for orange juice, you know. That was <laughs> what we used for diesel fuel sometimes, the SOP, when you place an order. But we got to know the guys, and sometimes they, uh, they, they, they became personal. They said, why don't you come out with the fuel trucks when they come out? We want to see who you are. We know you're not, you don't work all the time. We often did that. One of the things that we did, we were kind of a crazy unit in the Army. Uh, we had a, a flatbed truck, and nobody wanted to go to Da Nang, which was about 60 miles, clicks, or what we call click south of us, on Highway 1, close to the China Sea, and pick up pallets of Coca-Cola and beer. You pick up four ballots of coke on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, you got four pallets of beer. Why is that important? Well, we got to keep a pallet for every three cap pallets we delivered to the PX. We kept a pallet. That's 160 cases. There were 153 men in the unit. You know what we did. We had a good time. <laughs> beer was 10 piastres. I think cokes were like 25 or 50 piastres. We often used that to trade around with the other troops, especially for rain. We love the Marines, we always pick with them a lot. But uh, we would often take out to the field uh, the beer that we had or the Cokes. Everybody wanted a Coke, that was hard to get in Nam. Um, and these guys would say, you know, y'all go to Da Nang, why don't you bring back a few hamburgers and milkshakes, which we often would do, and french fries. It's a very profitable venture for us, I will tell you. They weren't free, I want to make that clear to you. You know how that goes. But we came back, and finally, that short, little prosperous venture came to an end when the PX took five direct rocket hits. Later on in 69, uh, the Army moved us over to Fubai Combat Base. At that time, Fubai was fairly secure, but not as secure as it should have been. And we left, uh, and I had to go back sometime in uh, late February to clean up our old bunkers to be sure they were police stuff pick up the Claymore mines, and some of you may understand when I say we had 55 gallon drums full of napalm, and the Claymore would set the napalm off in case of an enemy assault. We had to disarm all of that, and there was 138 Kentucky artillery unit that moved into our old base camp because they liked our motor food. Their job was to supply ammunition and artillery fire for the 101st Airborne, who usually was on the front lines. 
I ended up going to Bong Tao for a few months on something called infusion, and it's too long to explain that, but I ended up in Bong Tao with a buddy of mine, and we got word, uh, we, we stayed in good contact with all the other members of our unit, that on June the 19th of 1969, at a hill about 30 clicks south of where we used to be, the 138th artillery unit out of Kentucky had been attacked by over 100 sappers who had satchel charges. The, we had 2,200 1st Airborne infantry went on the front perimeter. They cut through the Constantino wire, the enemy did, and came through, killing uh, 10 or 12 of the um, 101st boys and 9 of the boys from Kentucky. <coughs> Chuck asked me one time, did I know anybody on this wall? Well, I do know some of the names on the wall, but basically I forgot the names and all a lot of the faces. Faces of guys that I used to take hamburgers to guys I used to see in the motor pool, guys I used to talk to when they'd order fuel. I knew a lot of them. It's tough when somebody you know disappears. I worry sometimes as an elected official and as a old Vietnam vet, I'm pretty old compared to a lot of you. I went when I was 24, that we've forgotten what it was about for someone to give their all. I'm gonna read the last part of what I was going to say simply because I don't want to ad lib on something that may end up in the newspaper or the television and be quoted wrong. After Christmas, as I said, we moved to Pubai. I would sometimes be sent on special missions to places like Dung Ha outside of the DMZ where Charlie would place mines to blow up the fuel bladders and the boats that the Marines operated. And our job was to figure out how to stop that, which we did. We had most of us in the unit were college graduates, although we were E-4s filling uh, officer slots. That's what, what our job was. I was an acting buck sergeant, which the Army doesn't have many of those. Ended up in play two in the Highlands, doing special mission work at Queen Tree, Camp Evans, and the Northern I Corps. A big deal. We got to know a lot of those guys. I knew a lot of the men that went down on one of the aircraft that was shot down as it took off with 70 guys going home. Not a survivor was left. We used to argue and, and laugh with the 101st Airborne guys and especially with the 138th Artillery Unit out of Kentucky that every Monday we had to take a malaria pill. Now a malaria pill would clean you out. It's worse than x lax I'll just tell you. So the Kentucky guys would say, you don't want to be in a tank after you've taken your malaria pill, locked up in one, because when you got the urge to go, you got to go. There's just no way out of it. But you get to know guys, and the reason I tell you that is to let you understand that we knew a little bit about these guys personally. They meant a lot to us. And it's hard to write someone's family and say, I knew your son, I knew him and mom, and I hope they didn't die in vain. As I said, I really don't remember a lot of the names on this wall, but I know their faces and some of the faces of those that have been killed in country. I know the names on the wall sometimes, but I really know the faces of the guys that are on this wall. The names on this wall are like names on many walls and statues throughout our country. It represents the price that we have paid for freedom for the freedom that we enjoy, Mr. Russo. It's the freedom of religion, of speech, of the right to assemble, to protest, of the press, of the freedom to disagree, the freedom to bear arms, and for the freedom to have a republic. The wall reminds us to honor those who defend our country, to be certain that they are treated with the dignity, respect, and appreciation that they deserve. This wall reminds us to care for those who return home with visible, and invisible wounds from war, no matter where they serve. Our prayer should be, may our gift of life be always remembered for those who gave their life. Yes, I know some of the folks on the wall, and we should pray for our nation's sake that they did not die in vain. Thank you.